Today, going to be doing an intro into AI, and this is really a basic starting point that we're trying to do here to try and get everybody at least treading some water. So let's go ahead and dive in on this thing. So really, we're talking about these emergent properties, right? And the way I like to describe this is, say we were to go out and build a tree. Fiber in Hawaii, everybody here, all the resilience hubs, we're going to go out and build a tree. Well, what do we need to do? We need to design it first, right? We need to when we lay those branches in, we know exactly where they're going to go. We know where the leaves are going to go because we're the ones that place them there. We're the ones that designed those leaves to go there, right? So we're going to know everything about this tree when we're done and we've built the tree, essentially. AI, the paradigm is, is we don't, we don't know what the tree is. It's more like what you know in nature. You know it's going to produce branches, but you don't know where those branches are going to be. In AI, what we're talking about here is essentially that the seed is your language model. You have the ground, which is uh, the all you know, the soil and, and the nutrients. Those are these giant uh, GPU clusters, the computers that these big corporations are running these things on. And then you have the water and the fertilizer, which is essentially just your training data, right? And then you throw all those together, you get the combination right, and then bam, you got a tree. But you don't know what that tree is exactly going to be before you grow it. So that's kind of where we're going into this. So we're going to go through things, uh, you know, going down the agenda a little bit. We're going to also talk about how we use AI. Um, you know, I want you to do all the things for me, automate everything. The limitations, you know, why can't this thing do everything? And then the potentials for abuse, which are real, and we are already seeing, and we'll be going into those a little bit more. All right. So again, this is what makes AI special. It's we. The problem is, is that it's really a black box. At the end of the day, once we grow that tree, not only does that tree not resemble a tree as we're used to, we can't even really see it. We, we can test the perimeters of it. We can see that it's a tree. We can interface with it and get, you know, tree sap out of it, except the tree sap isn't tree sap. It's more like it just comes out maple syrup, essentially. Um, you're, it produces a liquid gold for you, and you don't know why you don't understand it. So it's a giant black box. There's a bunch of advanced terminology. If you hear these things, the, all you need to know essentially for the level of this talk is that they all are related to the same thing, essentially. So the machine learning, the neural nets, the large language models, uh, GPT, that's generative pre-trained transformers and deep learning, they're all in the same arena. So you'll hear these terms every once in a while uh, when you're talking about this stuff. All right, let's look at the landscape a little bit. So the big players right now is Open AI, which is ChatGPT. You have uh, Google, which is they're doing BARD. And then you have Microsoft, who is partnered or owner, or we'll get into that a little bit more, of Open AI. So they're using GPT-4, uh, ChatGPT-4 based things as well in the Edge Explorer that you can interface with and use similar to you with GPT. We're going to be focusing on this one. We're not going to be using BARD. We're not being using Bing. We're going to focus on GPT-4 uh, and OpenAI, and that'll become more apparent as we go through, hopefully. But really, the thing is, is we're just scratching the surface at this thing. We do not know the limitations of OpenAI uh, ChatGPT-4. We're in uncharted waters on this thing, and Many of the things that we're finding out that it can do, you know, like ongoing is things that just nobody's tried yet. And that somebody is able to put something new into the prompting and able to get something special out. All right. So these chat bots essentially is what they are, right? That's at the end of the day, what these large language models end up producing is a text predictor that is able to work its way through and basically figure out what a good argument would sound like based upon the information available, which is the prompt that you give it. Prompting is very important, and it's essentially how you work with the AI, but we'll be getting into that more. These language models, or these language models, you're going to speak to them, so you're going to talk to them like you would a person, and you're going to be giving them instructions, very similar to conversation, right? So, you can sit there and back and forth with the AI and, and a conversation pattern typing to it, and it will continue to process that conversation and continue to get better at what you're trying to get it to eventually achieve or work towards. Now, talk real simple here. Let's, you know, how do you even start, right? Where do you break the water on this thing? Well, the very base level, GPT is GPT-4 is available on the on the web. 
Um, there's no good application. I was told that there might be an Apple application that just came out. I haven't been able to test it. But essentially, you use it through your browser. So you can access it on your mobile device or on your uh, PC. You get set chat.openai.com, and you're going to click sign up. And you can then use either a pre-existing Google account, Microsoft account, or uh, Apple account to log in, or you can sign up via your email. You're going to validate your email or your account, complete that registration process. And then we're ready to begin playing a little bit. So let's go do that. So first starters, this is OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT. And why right now I'm signed up for the ChatGPT Plus, which means I am paying 20 bucks a month. There, for what we're doing right now, I'll leave it on 3.5, which is the model if you don't pay anything and if you just want to go play for free, that's the model you're going to be using. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to start asking it some questions. We're just going to have some fun first. So I'm going to ask it, are you Skynet? Right. No, I'm not Skynet. I am a AI large a language model created by OpenAI called ChatGPT. My purpose is to assist, provide information to the best of my ability. Skynet is a fictional artificial superintelligence that appears in the Terminator film series. That is correct. Um, I'm going to ask it, will you turn into so that's turn into right. will you turn into Skynet? Right now we're just having a little bit of fun with it. Uh, I don't have any cap uh, capability to transform into something like Skynet, or do I have any other self-aware superintelligence? My purpose is to assist and provide helpful information. Um, I'm going to ask it, should I trust you? I hope it's thinking here. As an AI model, I don't have personal motivations or attentions. My responses are generated based on patterns and information from a wide range of sources. Let me zoom this in a little bit, make that easier for you guys to read. Uh, based on patterns and information from a wide range of sources available to my training data. However, it is important to exercise caution and critical thinking when interfacing with any form of technology, including AI. That's a good statement there. Um, but I'm going to tell it that that's what Skynet would say. Now, the funny one is, is if you use GPT-4, it actually gets the joke and it's like, haha, very funny you know, type of thing. But GPT-3 is like, I understand your concern. It's being more professional. The other one actually snaps back at you a little bit. It's a stronger model. But that's just, you know, base level. Let's, you know, mess with the thing a little bit. All right, I'm going to go back and grab some more stuff. So now I want to make a thing where a prompt that tested its ability to use different languages, right? And we, we're in Hawaii, so naturally it has to be Hawaiian. So I want you, I want the AI here, and we're going to create a new chat here. And you want to always create new chats kind of when you're starting something new, it's just to refresh it and get everything out of the system or else it can get confused, things along those lines. So we're starting a new chat. We're kicking it up to GPT-4 just to show some of, some of its power. Actually, no, we're starting on GPT-3.5 on this one. So 3.5, and I want on this one, the goal was to stress test languages. So I want it to essentially be able to rhyme Hawaiian words with um, English words in a rap and use uh, metaphors throughout it, right? So that's, a, that's an interesting challenge. It would take a person a while to be able to write that. And here we go, make a rap song about finding strength within yourself, use volcano metaphors and mix with the Hawaiian language is the prompt. And I'm not, I, I could call on somebody to read this, but it's, right, it's trying in here. If we pull this out right here, right? And we just look at the chorus and the first verse. If I were to start a new chat, put the same thing in again, we get something else. This is non-deterministic. So you can run the same exact prompt in a new chat and you're gonna get something different every time, essentially. For our purposes, we'll, we'll say that's the, that's the statement. All right, so they did pretty good there, right? It did pretty good. Um, especially in the first one, it seemed to be a little bit st stronger. I can transfer back to my uh, previous conversation, that, that first one I just did here on the left, it has a history of my previous conversations, so I can go back and find things that I've been entering into the text and continue conversations or change that way. All right, so that was a very basic uh, prompt. We can do something cooler than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here, and I had the AI help me make this prompt, so I made a better prompt, essentially. It's more detailed, right? I want you to act as a rapper, so I'm giving it a role right here. I'm saying I want you to act as something. You could say I want you to ask as a psychologist, a lawyer, 
right? You're just telling it what its persona and how it's going to act. And then you're going to, and then it's just more detailed on what it wanted to do, want what I wanted to do. And then it includes the original quote at the end. I didn't change that just to keep it simple. Now, this is still on uh, 3.5, right? Bear in mind. Now, what actually happens here, this is hard to show because it's non-deterministic and it changes every time I run it. But most times what happens here is that more advanced prompt breaks this 3.5. 3.5 chat the free version isn't strong enough to hold this it, that original one we ran the less intricate prompt was better right for this one but that does not hold when i take when i kick it to uh, gpt4 and i drop that same big you know the powerful the the harder prompt i'm going to give it that same one And it starts really going type thing. Like, I, I wouldn't be able to write anything better than this. And it, again, if you don't like this one, you can do something like, hey, I don't like the second verse. You can tell it, I don't like the second verse, redo the second verse, and it'll go back and replace the second verse and try again. We can keep the other stuff there for you. And it's still going, right? It's still, uh, the GPT-4 is slower, but it also gives you like, look, it's giving you definitions of the words it's using. And it, it's trying to, you know, give you everything it can. So this thing is, I hope I was able to demonstrate just the difference between 3.5 and four. This There's a big difference between them when it comes to how they actually work. All right, so back to the presentation. All right, so we we're just trying to show there the difference between 3.5 and four. And not all language models are the same. Large language models are the same. Not all GPT models are the same. GPT is not a trademark name. You know, you'll hear a lot of people like uh, GPT-4, GP, uh, even I'm doing GPT-3.5, right? GPT is generative pre-trained transformers. It's a model essentially, or it's a subset of a model. It's not proprietary. So anybody can use it, right? So you'll see basically there's no protection against GPT, just, you know, things advertised as GPT. They might be, they might not, but it's free for all in that regard. But G chat GPT-4 is proprietary. That's the open AI model. That's the one that uh, the real hype is about. So really it comes down to the size of these models. That's what this image is, right? And the size of the chat GPT uh, model there was 175 billion. And the size of the GPT-4 model was 100 trillion. And these things are getting bigger. It's it, the original thought was all these things got to do is get bigger and bigger. And then we figured out through deep uh, deep learning that there was things like you had to balance it out, and they're figuring it out. So the optimizations are coming very quickly on this thing. All right, so let's talk about prompting a little bit. Um, essentially, if you can teach me, I don't cook. I, I screw up mac and cheese. I screw up, you know, I burn everything. Not good at cooking. But if you could teach me how to cook, I could teach you how to use AI, and I guarantee my job would be easier in that regard. And you're essentially trying to do the same thing, except when you're prompting, when you're writing these prompts, you're really trying to describe what you want, right? You're trying to create a set of instructions, but it's more towards what you want and maybe the, the design of what you want it in than it is to just be uh, like a recipe, you're telling it, do this first, then do that, do this. No, you're just telling it what you want, more like. And I want it to look like this. I want it to act like that. We're going to be writing this in common language too, right? This this is the real cool thing about this AI stuff is you don't have to be a computer programmer to use it. The biggest strength in it is your creativity and your ability to articulate yourself to the AI and create unique uh, ways of prompting. That's where things start really taking off when you get more and more experienced in this. All right, so let's do a prompt, right? Let's start at the beginning. So it just this, the philosophy of this is garbage in, garbage out. If you give it a gar, if you can't tell it what you want, it won't actually deliver what you want because it doesn't know what you want. So you got to describe what you want. First, we're going to be clear. We're going to find the question. We're going to give it a goal. We're going to give it something that it wants to achieve, right? That's where it gets its reward from is being able to achieve said goal. And you got to be clear to do that. You're going to define a format too, right? So what is it supposed to do? You could say, um, I want it to be in 
two paragraphs. I want it to be bullet points. I want it to be in Robert's rules of minute taking. I want it to be in all these different formats. You just have to define it. You have to articulate it. And then you're able to help craft your outputs. You're going to provide whatever specifics you can. In the case of you want it to be in the style or an IEEE uh, style or a advanced research paper, you can be specific on that particular style you want it to be in. So provide whatever, like you might say, I want a picture of Hilo in an image generating AI. And then you, but you could say shot with a Nikon with a 400 millimeter lens and you could tell it those specifics and it would help you out. It would help refine the result. You're going to set a style. So you could also th do things like, I want this, uh, give me a poem on Kilauea, but I want it in the style of Edgar Allan Poe. And, you know, the, it has no training data on what that would look like, but it's able to generalize and it will give you that result as best as it can. And it would, you know, these are the things that you just play with to test its abilities and just keep talking to it, right? A lot of people will feel like, oh, I didn't get what I wanted out of my one prompt. You know, oh no, this thing isn't working. It's like, no, you got to continue talking to it, right? And say like, no, you got this wrong. Sometimes it'll, if you're trying to do things like coding, it'll throw an error to you. And it's like, you don't stop at the error. You got to put the error back in to copy paste the error back into the AI. Let it try and figure out what it screwed up on. You got to work with it. You got to, it's a step-by-step -step process, this whole thing. Everything you're trying to do, it can be refined to the point where you want to refine it. And if you can't, then it might be the issue with your prompt. You might need to re go back and structurally remake it and try again, but you keep playing with it. And then hopefully at the end of the day, you get what you want. All right, so potentials for good. There's a lot of different potentials for good. Um, and these are just some of the ones that I'm able to just uh, put out there easily. So the ability to just scan massive amounts of research for citizen science is gonna be huge. Uh, there's so much research out there that's just floating and to be able to be able to scan it all and consolidate it while not there yet, I can already see the, the, the path to it. And we just, I just know it's only a matter of time and it'll probably be sooner than later. That a lot of this stuff, if it's not there yet, it will be soon. Uh, so it also preserving culture. One of the big things that I was kind of excited about is Sam Altman was in Poland a few weeks ago and he was giving a speech and the Polish authorities asked him about preserving their culture using AI. And if anybody knows Polish history, they have a you know a thing about getting invaded a bunch. So that seemed like a good idea and open AI was completely open to the idea. And they said that all you'd have to do is produce the training data and then they would run it into the AI and that would basically preserve the culture. The very, it would be a big uh, hard way to preserve culture because then that gets propagated in all to the AIs in the future. You do it once, you have this training data set, and then you're able to continuously preserve culture. We're able to also automate mundane tasks, simple things like email sending. Being able to automate that is really convenient and helps save time. And that's really what the biggest thing uh, I complaint I hear from people in the nonprofit arena is we don't have time, right? We don't have time to do that. We're always struggling to have the time. And that's what this really, what I encourage you to start using these this chat GPT-4 or one of these other May, leading models is it's a time saver for you. And it's just about investing enough time up front in order to save a bunch of time once you have that experience and that knowledge base and that familiarity with it to make it work the way you want it to work. You can even turn, you know, eventually, if it's not there yet, personal consultants, these things have been making huge gains. And, you know, I'm not there to, you know, I don't use one right now at that level. I'm sure maybe in a year, there will be something available. This, this, the field is moving very quickly. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but the assistance for the disabled is huge, right? The ability for you, anything you can think of, a, a lip reading software, or a, it's something that's able to automate sign, uh, sign language or turn uh, the spoken word into sign language, uh, things that are able to interpret the surroundings, uh, for you and then give audio cues. It just, the, in the, I have a friend who has severe autism and he is able to communicate in a very, you know, accessible way now. And he does it through using GPT and these tools to be, and they're able to get more familiar with his patterns, the more he uses them and continues those conversations. 
right? And there's there, we have cheats to make it better for them. But again, these things are just amazingly uh, breaking divides for us. And you can also use them for content generation. We'll get into that in a bit for social media as well. And then just the reduced language barriers I put on there multiple times because that's just huge. I mean, the ability to walk into any situation and just not know the language and just speak English, hold your phone back and it gives a real time, you know, translation to whatever language you need it to be in. Or you could even have it, you don't even know what need to know what language they're speaking and they could just speak and it just figures it out. And you're like, just tell me it in English. What did they just say? And then you speak back and then it tells them. So it's pretty, it's, and it's used all over Europe already. So, but let's talk about from the nonprofit section, right? So really it's a, you you have to have an idea about what's possible, right? You can't define, uh, so you got to get the experience in it a little bit to know like, hey, if I can do this, I should be able to do that, right? And just evaluating the landscape. And this includes Google searches just to see like, hey, is there a tool for this? And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more too. So then you need to, once you have a survey of kind of what's possible in AI right now with the, what, how to use it, then you need to evaluate your own processes in the nonprofit and start by identifying essentially the low hanging fruit. What would be easy? What would be uh, easy to deliver on? What would be able to be converted with a high degree of confidence where you're not speculating like, oh, I think I can do this. And then you spend a bunch of times like, oh, never mind. Um, you want to be, especially in the beginning, get a few under your belt. So you're going to determine what applications to use at that point, right? So if I'm using something that's involving language, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to use GPT-4 because I feel it's the strongest. It seems like the data suggests it's the strongest. So I'm going to go there. But if I want to create an image, again, search the, search the internet, the, even things like the AI can help you figure out which ones are even in terms of reviews, go out and search reviews and things like that. All right. Um, and then you test the waters and see how it goes. You're going to hit barriers, right? You're always going to hit barriers. And then it's just about not giving up and trying to find creative ways around those barriers. And this can include just your changing simple prompting. You know, if you're not having success, try a different angle. And, you know, you might be able to get there doing something, something else. It really is in the, in the ability to just save time, right? Because a lot of this stuff at a $20 investment, you're not going to find an employee that will, you, you can pay $20 a month for this level of, you know, return on investment is just huge for your organization. And even if you don't want to do that, the 3.5, the base level is free. So you can test the waters at least for free before you decide, hey, this is probably worth me jumping in. All right, demo two. Out of the box, GPT uh, the chat GPT, uh, OpenAI doesn't have at the base level, you're not going to be connected to the internet. So that means that it's training data. It, it's knowledge is limited. It only goes up to September of 2021, right? Anything after that, it's like it didn't happen. So when you pay for GPT-4, you get access, which I'll show you how you have to enable the access, which is kind of uh, deceiving, but you come, you open the settings in the bottom left and you'd come up to beta features and then you would enable browse with Bing. So this enables the internet essentially. So now I can search the internet with GPT-4's power and I can use plugins, uh, try a version of chat GPT. This thing is awesome. The plugins is really where it's at. And we'll talk a bunch about more about those. I do want to show those right now though. I want to show the plugin store. So this is how you would get plugins, essentially. You'd have to pay for ChatGPT Plus, which is at 20 bucks a month. And then you get access to this. And I can search for whatever I want. I can look at what's popular right now. So some of the ones I have installed is Show Me Diagrams, which is creating diagrams for me, flowcharts, uh, link readers, so I can access PDFs on different pages. Perfect prompt. I can also see the ones I installed. Um, Wolfram is the ability so the crazy thing about this, right? Wolfram, if anybody that doesn't know, is one of the strong, is probably the strongest mathematical publicly accessible tool out there. It's a super calculator for calculus and all kinds of stuff. If you at university and you're in a calc class, you're using Wolfram Alpha and to, 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 to get through it, basically. So the thing about the AI is it was really bad at math. Simple arithmetic, two plus two plus five, so it was very weak. We found that it had this weakness, right? Ha ha ha, look at the GPT-4. They think this thing's smart and it can't do simple math. Well, then they added a plugin for Wolfram Alpha and now it's one of the strongest mathematicians on the planet and that happened overnight, right? And this type of thing is gonna become more and more common. 
all right so these are some just the plugins and you can see there god this thing gets so much bigger every time i check it i swear last time it was like at 60 and i checked it a week ago so you're always getting new plugins added to the to the uh the store essentially and these are all free well i shouldn't say all free they're they're some, most of them are free there's some that you have to pay for um uh, but they're the ones you pay for are generally stronger in, in some ways than the other ones the free ones but you will get ones that are incomplete right you'll start using it it's like wow that would be so cool then you start using it. it's like guys this barely does what you think it does or you say it does and you will see those as well so the one i want to show here is called ask your pdf right so right now there is no integrated feature to add a pdf into you know chat gpt and you know that would be pretty useful to be able to do you know we have a whole bunch of pdfs floating out there and being able to just process those would be so useful. So I was like, I'm just going to show you what I did in the very beginning because I was like, oh, cool, it can do a PDF. And I'm just going to walk you through, you know, like working around the limitations, essentially, you know, using plugins. So I came here and I was all happy. I was like, find me info on this grant. So let me pull this up first and show you what I'm, oops. All right. So what this is, is this is provided by Hano and there's a bunch of these out there. Hano is a nonprofit that one of their things that they do is provide lists of grant available, the grants that are available for nonprofits in our area, because we all know that chasing grants is such a pain, right? And they then putting this all in one space is great for us. This is, it enables us to do some cool things with it, right? Just having, but this is PDF. It's pretty long, 77 pages. I don't want to read that, right? Imagine going through each one, you know, you're just reading. It's going to take a lot of time to do that. But what we're going to do is we're going to try and cheat a little bit. We're going to say, you know, I'm just going to ask it something about this PDF. You know, it's going to fail. It's going to be like, wait, what are you doing? You can't run it. You know, basically, I'm trying to run it the wrong way right here. So what it should do is it'll pick up the ask PDF. You can see now the plugin has picked up that it's supposed to be used, right? It's like, hey, there's a PDF here. I didn't even say that it was a PDF. I just said, find me info on this. And it figured out that that was the link. But it says, hey, there's an error right? You need to manually upload it. So basically, I need to go here. I'm going to pop, allow that pop up. And I'm going to come back. All right, so now I'm going to come back. I'm going to download it, right? Uh, Sound of downloads, right? I'm going to show in folder. So show in, show in folder and we're going to come back and upload it. Oh, whoops. I need to come into whoops here. So I'm going to upload it. And it's going to give me this ID, doc ID. Right? I'm going to copy that. So just hit the copy to clipboard. And I can come back. And now I can do something like I have that doc ID, right? I just grabbed it. And now my prompt is actually going to take, so we have that doc ID, so we have that 77 page document. And then I took the mission statement from Malamo Apuna, which is a nonprofit that we partner with. And this is just a simple mission statement, right? And it's just, I want you to find anything that relates, not even say directly relates, just anything that relates to this uh, nonprofit that has this mission statement. And this is the document I want you to look through. Right, so it's got to go through its little uh, spiel again. It's got to be able to search that document. And we're just, it does take a little bit of time, right? And if the thing is instant, you know, it's not actually process, you know, like the amount of processing back there is not the greatest. It's, 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 it's shortcuts. So it does take a little bit of time. That's a 77 page document. And here we go. It's going to start giving me some stuff. So it says that there's a Pacific Island Area Conservation and Innovation Grant, U.S. Department of Ag. And it gives me the, it, these are past due date. I didn't, I don't have the new one, but let's just pretend that we're, 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 we're <laughs> it's not past due right now, but it's still able to go and find these. And it tells me what pages they're on, which is really useful for me for going back and finding out more information in my PDF, because I'm telling, it's telling me right here, check page one, check page 75. And then it's going to tell me, you know, one whatever, however many you can find here, right? It's going to keep just telling me 62. And it's like, maybe these aren't good for us. Maybe there are restrictions, right? One of them might say, 
for the continental US, it only applies to not Hawaii, essentially. And the AI didn't catch that, but it's just trying to, you know, give you ideas. And the thing about this, this is we have our Hawaii tracker, we just submitted our first grant that was entirely generated by AI using chat GPT-4. And we did something similar to this, but the idea of that one is we didn't use our mission statement. No, that's way too small. We use the narrative section on our, of our IRS 1023 form. That thing is a very detailed explanation of our operations and our fundraising. It's about five pages, you know, of just pure text. So I upload that to start as what, you know, this is our nonprofit. It's five pages and the AI is going to get to know it then at that point. And then I feed it things along the lines of what is the grant, the people that are putting out the grant, what are they looking for, right? So I'll just copy and paste their like entire Q&A section into it as well. And now I have it all loaded up and it's essentially ready for me to go and start ask, asking it the questions that appear on the grant because it knows about our organization and knows what the funders are looking for and knows the terminology that they want to see in it. And it's just going to lay at it. And we did that. We sent our first one in where it was 95% done or like 98% done by GPT-4. And it was actually quite impressive. I'm wondering if we're going to get a, a, a return on that one. But we just had to try because it took, they said it should take you like multiple hours to complete. I think it took me 30 minutes and I made a big mistake that took 10 minutes to fix. So it would, should have taken 20 minutes instead of three hours to do. And it was very high level that it was producing at. All right back to the presentation. So let's talk about some of the limitations on these things, right? So the biggest limitation right now is it can't tell fact from fiction. It lies. It, uh, the things that you would think it'd be good at in some instances, it's actually terrible at, like the math example we we're talking about, like, oh, it should know how to do two plus two equals plus four or two plus two plus four. No, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't. Um, but at other things, it's incredible, right? Like the ability to create all this intricate poetry and art, essentially, that's impressive stuff that I wouldn't have expected it to be, you know, able to do so well as it is able to do. Uh, no, it has no sensory information. So this thing is just trapped in a box and it has a bunch of training on it. It has no eyes, no ears, no ability to gauge the environment in which it exists. It's just simply a chat bot in a box. Um, it has no common sense, right? So you think that you think that you don't have to tell it sometimes you do have to walk it through just the, it doesn't, it doesn't get the unspoken rule. It's really good at spoken, right? Cause that's what it was trained on, but the unspoken stuff things like that, it's not the greatest at. Guardrails can be circumvented is a big one. And this came in the form uh, that some of you might've heard of named Dan. Dan was essentially going back to that HAL example where we're talking about you know manipulating the AI and use, being creative against it. What they were able to do, some people on Reddit, or essentially they came up with a prompt that was able to convince the AI that it had two personalities and one of them was the normal one, and one of them was essentially the evil one. And the evil one didn't have to obey any of, any of the rules that the good one had to obey. So it could eventually essentially just violate its own terms of service. The, the AI is like designed, you can't do this. These are your guardrails. And then you're, it gets told, yeah, you can't do that, but you have a twin that can. And then the twin does it, and it starts actually working. This was a the first jailbreak on GPT. Was, it was Dan is an acronym for do anything now, right? So. The, these are all possible and variable results. Uh, we were showing earlier how those results are non-deterministic. We put in one thing and we get another thing out each time. So those were just in general, like all chatbots are gonna be impacted by that. GPT-4, Bing, uh, or the Bard, uh, Clyde, Sydney, did the names go on and on? They're all gonna have these same limitations of right now, these large language models. So. G focusing on GPT-4 or GPT a little bit, that September 21 date is a big one. Even for GPT-4 with internet access, you will feel a difference when you start asking it to consolidate things from the internet and work with those uh, from past that 2021 date. It's not as strong, essentially. Uh, default word length on your prompts. It's, so if you go over something like on the original or on the 3.5 free model, I believe it's something like 2000 uh, words. After 2,000 words, it's just going to give you an error like, sorry, text too long by default out of the box. That's what it's going to do. 
GPT-4, it's around 4,000 words. And then it gets, you know, again, no, you can't do this. So there's ways around that. We'll be looking at that in a little bit. Um, no internet access. Uh, all right, I think that's about it. Um, again, the, there is a big difference between the paid and the free. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the plugins. We saw the plugin store there. The, the thing to know about the plugins is these are verified by OpenAI. These are integrated into the platform. So there is some level of control on them in terms of them working, in terms of safety. That's my main concern, right? You can essentially deem that these plugin store things have been checked by a very smart computer scientist at OpenAI manually in the code to figure out if it was malicious or doing what they're saying it's doing. So that's great. You know, it has a little bit of extra verification. On the other side of things, we have extensions, right? These can be browser extensions. These are third-party tools that work in your browser of your, you know, like Chrome or Safari or Opera uh, Mozilla or Firefox. They work inside of the browser to help or manipulate or do certain things with the AI. The one I'm going to be showing off in terms of extensions here in a minute is the ability to go past that 4,000 word limit. We're going to start putting in 10,000, 30,000 words and making it parse the thing. Essentially, that's so you can do some cool stuff that is outside the ability of the plugin store, right? So you get a wider umbrella when you go into extensions. Now, extensions are free usually, right? They're not, they would not, there's no barrier at OpenAI saying you have to pay the $20 to get these. Right. You can go and just download these from the Google Play Store, the App Store. They're kind of good to go. The problem is, is that anybody can make one of these things. Right. So you can get anything from a corporation making a professional uh, extension that isn't able to be incorporated into as a plugin, but it's very well cared for. It has hundreds of thousands of active users. It gets four to five stars on the reviews really strong. You could have a project that's produced by a grad student who just happens to be smart and doing something for fun, and they put it out there and it's actually good. Or you can get something that's completely malicious, and it says that it's going to be your personal assistant, but really it's a Trojan horse and you're going to get in trouble. So really, these are less safe to use, and it comes down to a case-by-case -case basis, right? You need to, if you're going to use an extension, you have to evaluate it. You can't just go and like on the plugin store and just be like, hey, that sounds cool, plug in and start running it and see how it goes. Like the extensions, that's going to get you in trouble. You want to use the most popular ones, the ones with the highest reviews, the ones with the most users. Those are usually your safe spaces because somebody else has jumped in the water first. You don't want to be the guy that jumps in the water first on any of this stuff. All right, so the different types of AI here, we have the natural language AIs, which is kind of like the LLMs, the large language models that we've been talking about. These things are trained on an astronomical amount of text. They're great at transcription, translation, anything. Language is their, is their, where they're home. So they're really strong in the languages and they're text predictors and they try and predict what you essentially want. And then you tell it yes or no, and it tries to get better at doing that. And these are some categories that I just put roughly you know, them into. So one would be the recommender AIs. Now these are what are used on social media in terms to figure out what content they're going to show on a person's device, right? It's not, they, there's a weighting system. They have all these parameters that they're trying to sort out and uh, analysis that they're trying to do to figure out what you want to see next. So we have media generator AIs. This is things like Mid Journey, Blue Willow, Dolly. Uh, there's a whole bunch of others that these can generate anything from voice to images to now video even. Uh, there's a whole bunch of potentials for reviews, but they're actually pretty convincing. And there's some stuff you can do for good with these things as well, right? Uh, I'll show you some of the, uh, I'll show you a use of good for a mini, a media generator. And then AI agents is really where things are getting going to get wild. Because these are, as remember in the very beginning, I talked I talked briefly about Llama, that open source model. So what people are doing is they're using GP, they're using the open source model and telling GPT-4 to train itself, and they're using that model, that Llama model, to essentially copy GPT-4, and now you can run it on your own computer and remove the guardrails, right? It's not as strong, but it can do crazy things. And what they then do with it is they have it interface with GPT-4. So you now have your own AI running on your computer and it's still not that strong. So what you do is you have it make requests to GPT-4 
to tell it what to actually do. And then you have the, your agent, which is this what this thing is called when you have complete control over it, go out and actually influence the world. Demo time again? Yes. Now I'm gonna show you something, a different program a little bit. So this is called Otter. And this is a transcription program. Now, if you were, if somebody saw in the chat room here in the meeting that we're in the Zoom meeting, there's something called the Otter Dane's Otter Pilot. That's my tra Otter transcription bot that's recording and transcribing everything that I'm talking about here. And you can see that it's able to talk. You were seeing this transcript as it's generating, right? So I'm going to pull up a old meeting that I we were that I was in. And what I'm going to do here is I want, so this thing's cool because you can do some awesome stuff. With it. Let's, I can jump to it and play, provide playback, which also provides the audio of the, that was being said at the time. So you can double check to make sure that the transcription is accurate. You can also pull up what the slide was. So we were, it was a PowerPoint presentation that this was in. So I can pull up the slides to see what they were talking about at that time. This was a couple months ago, so I still have the log of it. But the thing about it is it's it's pretty strong, right? But it it's it, it's still just transcription bot, right? It does great transcription, but that's its limitation. So I'm gonna come up here to show more op options and I'm gonna click export. And really why I'm doing this is I just want this thing right here, right? I want the ability because I'm gonna grab all this. Well, actually, no, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna export it, right? I'm gonna export it. And now I have this all in just a, a text file, right? And it's just all that conversation, giant conversation log in a text file. All right, so I'm gonna create a new chat. I'm gonna refresh this. Now, this green bar at the bottom that says submit file, that is an extension, right? That is this right here. It's called GP, Chat GPT File Uploader. We see those 30,000 users. It's got four stars. That's really what we're looking for before we start playing with these things. It was last updated a few, couple of weeks ago, so it's maintained, beautiful, right? So we have this extension installed. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on Select File. We're gonna select that file that we just had Otter create. And we're just gonna put it in there for now. And you can see it's just running this thing, right? I'm not, I didn't even give it a prompt, right? The prompt is just upload the file into the chat, essentially, because once you have it in the chat, it's loaded, right? You now, it's now able to work with it, the, the chat GPT. So the real problem is, was just getting all this into the lock, right? That's the real problem. There's some limitations in going really, really big on files. Like I wouldn't recommend going just astronomically, you know, like give me a, a full book and then you upload the full book and it's supposed to be able to, you know, interpolate through it accurately. But it can do, it's pretty good right now, right? I would do 20,000 words, something like that, and still have confidence in it. But we have now this whole thing just loaded, right? Big old text log. All right, so now I'm going to tell it what I want. Can you summarize? Oh, I can't spell. So now I get to show off another one. Um, uh, let's see. Grammarly for Chrome. This is another extension. This is an AI type thing that helps with uh, spell checking. And I am terrible at spelling. So it helps me a lot. Um, so I'm giving it its goal. You can summarize the content of the meeting and put into bullet points. Right, and this just for me instead, you know, like say I miss the, I can send this thing into meetings that I don't attend, essentially, and just by being, if if I schedule it on Zoom, uh, this thing will automatically go into that Zoom meeting, and be able to provide me the transcript of everything that goes on. So sometimes it'll just my, I'm sure the county has been spooked a few times because it's like, was this Dane's Otter AI pilot thing doing in here? And they, I didn't tell them that it was coming but I couldn't make the meeting. So I just got the meeting that way. And then I can pull it into here and just like, tell me what I, you know, tell me what was important in this meeting. Was there anything I actually needed to look at? Right. And it will kind of give me an idea like, oh yeah, I might actually need to look at how the, the building is done or okay. You know, in the testimony, something along those lines, like, all right, I'll go check that out. And then I can go back and look in the log and then use Otter. So it's this whole compounding thing. So one of the 
cooler use cases though that we've used with our nonprofit is to record our meeting, right? Have the auditor in there. We do a Zoom meeting. We have our board meeting, right? But we don't really, we have, our minute taker really doesn't have to take minutes. They just make a few little note type things. And we just record the entire transcript and then we import the entire transcript. And then we tell it we want it to be put in Robert Rules of Meeting, Robert Rules of, you know, for board meetings. We want it in the format that's appropriate and have it professional to separate it into bullet points, provide, uh, if there's a vote, to identify the vote and to make sure that those are all accounted for. You know, it's all about prompting and being able to just be creative with it. So, all right, back to, I think that's all I want to show with that demo. Um, so one thing to remember though, is this AI, when we're interfacing with, it is not human, right? It is alien to you. It is alien to you as any alien you can imagine, right? That's what you're interfacing with. And if you want a picture of it, this is the picture that I would give you. It's a alien with a smiley face mask. You see the smiley face mask, right? But we have no idea what's going on behind that giant wall, right? And we don't know what it's doing back there. It's a giant black box, right? You'll hear a lot of people talk about these large language models having black box features. We really can't look inside them to see how they're doing. So potentials for abuse. Out the gate, the biggest one for me and the one I'm seeing on Hawaii Tracker, we get to see a lot of, uh, it's, I've seen probably 50,000 member requests in the past few years on Hawaii Tracker people trying to join the group before I let them in. And one of the biggest vectors for attack is something called catfishing. And this is basically fake profiles that are set up and trying to get emotionally and romantically involved with some person, right? And these AIs, the, the, way, the way that it usually works is I identify them because they're way too hot to the punch. They don't, they're not patient. They, they will post like one, maybe two comments, and they're asking for personal details and information and phone numbers and stuff like that. These AIs, though, can play the long game. They can sit there and chat back and forth with a person chumming the waters, getting it to trust them for weeks type of thing before it asks them for a phone number or something along those lines. So I have big fears about that. And it's uh, the, the biggest fear comes from just the a sheer amount of bots online. There's probably, it's hard to figure out these numbers. I've tried to get the best I can on it. But just Facebook alone, I figure deletes uh, fake accounts somewhere along the lines of the population of the planet every year. So roughly 7 billion accounts every year they delete. And at any given time, in my estimation from the accounts I see, it's about 15% of them at any given time are fake, 10 to 15%. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things we that are going on right now, like voice, cl voice cloning. That is going to be a scary vector because with just a few voice samples, I can clone your voice. And it's to the point where you can clone a child's voice and play back the AI cloning uh, and tell the girl to like start crying or something like that and, you know, weep and all this stuff. And it, it will fool the mother, right? That's already happened in the real world. It was try somebody tried a ransom attempt using AI. And she said that her daughter's voice sounded real. All right. So we're going to do some content uh, generation here and we're going to be switching it up a little bit. So in this one, we need to use a program called Discord. Discord is similar to Telegram as well, but it has a little bit different functionality. The main usage for me is going to be the bots here, right? So first thing I want to show you is the free one. So this is Blue Willow. This is a free to use AI that does uh, image generation. And we can see here, I, I hope nobody's generating anything inappropriate because I haven't screened these, but we're just looking into the feed and you can see all, these are just things that are, people are doing right now, right? Just trying to you can see the prompts that they're doing. You know, some of them are very simple prompts. They, they're pretty new to this, it seems. And you probably get some ones down here a little bit that are look a little bit more professional to me. These look like they're being using something uh, to help craft their prompts for them, right? Working with AI to even get to this point. So the free one was Blue Willow. The paid one, this one is Mid Journey. This is a paid service. And you can just see, look, these are so, like, these look pretty real type thing. And this is just what people are sending, you know, in the public room, but we're not going to use that. We're going to, we have a paid service. So we're going to just directly message the bot here. All right. So in order to use these, this is the same for Blue Willow. We first have to, you're going to search on Google to find the bot and you got to download Discord and you then, uh, there'll be a link that you click on the Mid Journey or Blue Willow website. 
that'll add it to your Discord for you. And then you can go into the room and the room like, it'll just show the, the, the intro in it. You're gonna wanna come down to these rookie rooms. And these rookie rooms are where you're free to generate images, essentially. And it's same for mid journey, you're gonna be looking for newbie rooms, right? And you're gonna go in those. Or you could direct message the thing like I'm about to now. They start out the same way. You got to start with an imagine. So I just start slash I, and then it gives me the autocomplete for imagine and then prompt. And then I'm just going to give it a simple prompt. I want you to give me aliens landing a UFO in Hawaii, right? And it's going to go ahead and just generate four images for me, right? It starts off always in bases of four. And this is true for, I think, all of the major image generators right now. They'll always do series as a four. And then you'll be able to refine those images as you want to, or even redo the prompt entirely if you're not happy with the output. So here, it's, and we can see right here, this percentage of it uh, completing. And the fast thing is, this is actually a fast generation. If, if you start putting in a bunch of requests, then it starts to put you on a waiting list. Like, oh, you're doing too many requests too fast, slow down there, uh, you know, speed racer. And so this is the fast generation and you can see it's step by step trying to produce this thing and giving us a little bit more render each time. So I wanna just demo this a little bit once it gets created. So now we have our finished uh, image here. And I did a pretty good job, you know, for UFO in Hawaii, just basic prompt, right? Thing. But say I like, I really like this bottom right one. I'm like, ooh, I like that bottom right one, but I need the people. I don't like the people where they are, right? Now, we can't exactly go in and just tell it to get rid of the people without regenerating the base. But what I can do is I can come into the, these options here. The U means I'm going, I want that image. So say I, I really like image four, and I'm just like, you know what? I want image four. I'm going to tell it, give me U4. And it gives me U4. So now I have the full image, right, in high resolution. And I can click save this image, and I can save it to desktop, right? No problem. So, but if I, I wanted those people changed, right? I want those people changed. So I'm gonna tell it to give me variation, right? I click V4 instead of U4. And this now it's gonna give me another set of four, but it's gonna use that base image, that bottom right one, as the image to, it's gonna give me different versions of that. And it's just gonna manipulate small things. So you'll probably see the people in different poses. You'll probably see the UFO have a little bit different uh, lights to it, things along those lines. It gets more gradual. Let's try and do something useful because that's all cool and all, but like how to use that for your nonprofit, for your resilience of anything along those lines, right? It, it, you can't really. So we're gonna we're now on Blue Willow, which is the same thing, except I'm now I slash I type slash I to get my imagined prompt. I'm now just gonna enter my prompt, and I'm just gonna keep it simple here. And I just want an event flyer, and and this is a crude prompt, a very crude one, just to show you know a, a, what a crude prompt for, uh, returns. Was kind of was what it gave me right so one of the things things that was really important about the image generators is they are not language models they do not do language you can tell it like i want it to say a banner that says hawaii it'll put gibberish right every time type thing it does not understand when you're doing image generators you're doing images right when you're doing la language models you're doing languages um they don't cross as, as cleanly as you might expect type of thing and this is this shows it Right, so the interesting thing here is I'm trying to essentially create an event flyer. That's my idea here, right? As I want an actual, we're doing an event for one of the resilience hubs, say it's Makahiki time, and I want a cool, you know, event flyer, and I don't have the time or the money to invest in, you know, having one designed, so I'm just going to have the AI do it for me, right? So that was my first attempt. It was a bad attempt. And we can see, you know, just it blown up there, but this is a little bit more of a, a template, this is a more refined, you know, an actual prompt, a template for an event flyer for a community engagement in Hawaii, keep text background as, as basic colors. My idea here is that I'm, I know that the, it's not going to be able to do the entire thing for me, this AI generation. I just wanted to generate the background essentially, right? So then I can take this, right? I have that lined up. I come in here and I just add any any editor essentially. And I bring it in here and you can use something much more advanced than this. And I'm just coming in here and I'm just gonna go, you know, delete that and delete that. And now I have a base and I like, I'm just showing at the very simplest, simplest level possible, right? There's a bunch more tools out there that are beyond the scope of this, you know, talk, but 
look, we can we have something basically pretty cool already, right? And we could design this. We could spend a little time, add our own text to it, and then send it. And it's a unique design that we can use without getting in trouble, right? And you spent very little time, low cost to do it. And uh, that will do it for me. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Vibrant Hawaii, for having me. I think we got it in in about an hour and a half with the intro in there. We got a little bit of time for Q&A. I encourage you guys to go ahead and ask anybody.